I'm going to show you why I consider Jim Rohn my biggest mentor. I'm sure you'll find many mind openers and insights in the materials I've prepared. And please note your findings because as John Didier said, a famous journalist and writer, I don't know what I think until I write it down. It's so true. For those of you who know me for some time, the name of Jim Rohn shouldn't be a surprise. For those of you who don't, please check out more videos about this channel and you'll find out more. I call myself mentored by Jim Brown because he was the one who created my earliest tipping point moment showing me the first time what personal development means with his favorite quote, success is something you attract by the person you become. It was my first notion about the importance of self-improvement and I thought this is really something. I was in the university then, in a moment when I started balancing school with business on the sidelines. We just ticked. When I read his book about the seven strategies for wealth and happiness, I was like, wow, this is my boy. And later on, I've had the chance to meet him in person. And I'm so glad I did because he's not with us anymore. But his legacy stays. And by doing this tribute video, I intend to be a small part of it. I found his wisdom and humor so unique that he became by far my favorite mentor. The second tipping point moment he created for me was to implant the word discipline in my mindset, something I was not at all good at. I was all over the place, literally, and never appreciated the idea of discipline, none of less to apply it. It sounded so boring and disruptive that I never ever thought I could be fascinated by it. Today is one of my skill friends. Jim Rohn is not so much in the mainstream like other names, even though he was the man in his field. But he is a lot more than many of you may think, because his philosophy about life and parts of it are today actions and strategies for an impressive number of successful people, many of them celebrities. The importance of the seasons in business, it comes from him. Now you can read everywhere about it, but I found him to be the first who created such a great analogy. Another shocker for you would be to find out that he was the first life-changing mentor for Tony Robbins, who worked with him for three years, starting when he was 17. Mm, well, I was 19 when I read his first book. Luckily, as I said before, his legacy stays alive through all of those mentored by him and his lessons which are applied by the great minds all over the world. No further delays, let's immerse ourselves in one of his most notable speeches. I feel the parts that impacted my life. I hope they were yours too. Before I disappear, please subscribe if you haven't. Give me a like or a comment and let's make this world a better place by growing ourselves together. Let me tell you my story. I grew up in Idaho, farm country. Uh, my father still lives on the old homestead where I grew up, southwestern Idaho. He'll be 91 his next birthday, and I'm very proud of him. Uh, I went to high school. I graduated. I went to college one year. Halfway through my second year, I decided I was smart enough, so I quit. One of my major mistakes. I should have stayed in school. But I thought, you know, heck, I'm smart enough to get a job. And back then I thought, you know, that was it. If you're smart enough to get a job, what else would you need? Found out later, a big mistake. But anyway, I uh, quit school at age 19, went to work. A little while later, persuaded a beautiful young lady to marry me with a lot of fancy promises. And fortunately for me, we got married. A little while later, I started my family. And I'm out there working hard, doing the best I thought I could. But year by year, I kept falling a little further behind. Uh, you know, buying a little more than I could conveniently pay for on time. 
And uh, the creditors are finally starting to call saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm not feeling at all good about that. About age 25, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank and uh, way behind on my big mouth promises to my family and wondering what could I do to make my life better. Uh, I was willing to work hard. That was not my problem. But I just wasn't making the progress I wanted to make. And then good fortune came my way. Sometimes it's difficult to describe good fortune, why something remarkable happens to you at a particular time. Uh, one of my friends says, well, hey, things don't just happen. Things happen just. And maybe that's it, I don't know. But my good fortune was I had a chance to meet a very wealthy man. His name was Mr. Schof, Mr. Earl Schof. A friend of mine had gone to work for him, and he started telling me about this man. He said, you've got to meet this man. He's rich, but he's easy to talk to. And he's got a remarkable philosophy of life. And he kept going on, and I thought, well, I've got to meet this man. So shortly after that, I had a chance to meet this Mr. Schof, and I was impressed. He was rich. Uh, he was easy to talk to. Uh, within a few minutes, I was dazzled. And I said to myself, I would give anything if I could be like that, rich and easy to talk to. What would it take? And then I thought, if I could just get around somebody like him, and if he would teach me and coach me, uh, I would do it all. And that was my good fortune. A few months later, this wealthy man, Mr. Schof, hired me and gave me a job. And I went to work for him, and I spent the next five years in his employ. And then, unfortunately, at age 49, he died. But I got to spend five years with this remarkable man, his last five years of his life, and the first five years of my new life, and my dream came true during that five-year period. This man took the time to teach me and coach me. He taught me the books to read. He taught me the disciplines, and he taught me the skills. And he taught me the changes to make in my language and personality. And the things he shared with me during that five years uh, changed my whole life. This one I had to struggle with, personal development. It was hard for me to give up my old blame list. It was so comfortable blaming the government and blaming my negative relatives and the company, company policy, unions, wage scale, economy, interest rates, prices and circumstances and all that. That was difficult for me to give up. That was quite a transition for me to make and blaming myself. But Mr. Shove started out with something very, very important. Let me give that to you. He said, it's not what happens that determines the major part of your future. It's not what happens. What happens, happens to us all. He said, the key is what you do about it. It's not what happens, it's what you do about it. And he said, if you will start that process of change, do something different the next 90 days than you did the last 90 days, like picking up the books to read, do something different like the new health disciplines, relationship with your family, whatever it is, doesn't matter how small it is. If you'll start doing different things with the same circumstances, since we cannot change the circumstances, but we can change ourselves, we can change what we do. And then he gave me another secret to success when he said, what you have at the moment, Mr. Rohn, you've attracted by the person you've become. What you have at the moment, you've attracted by the person you've become. Now I said, well, how can I change all that? He said, very simple. If you will change, everything will change for you. You don't have to change what's outside. All you've got to change is what's inside. To have more, you simply have to become more. And then he said, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. Start working on yourself, making these personal changes. And he said, it'll all change for you. So let's talk a little bit about personal development, that extraordinary adventure I undertook starting at age 25. And I've never ceased that adventure. I'm still going for it in the 90s. I want to get better and better. I want my craft to get better, my business operations to get better, the things I do to get better. Because once I picked up this simple formula, 
I'm telling you, it's easy to figure out where the problem is if you go to work on it. Now, let's talk about personal development. And in helping kids understand personal development, I always start with money. Now, money's not the only place to start. Money certainly isn't the only value, but we've all got to start somewhere. And money's something you can count, right? Kids are interested in money, okay? A lot of things are a little tougher to measure, but economics is pretty easy, right? Because you can count, okay? Somebody says, how are you doing? You say, I don't know, let's count. Now, this is not the only count. I understand that. There's a lot of other things to count. But to see if there may be some errors in your judgment and lack of disciplines in your life, we might as well start with money because it's so easy to count. So let's just start there and see whether or not maybe we have messed up. Okay. So here's how I explain it to kids. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Key to understanding economics. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Marketplace is also described as reality. Reality, the marketplace. Now, it takes time. It takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but we don't get paid for time. It's very important for kids to understand, as well as adults. We don't get paid for time. Mistakenly, the man says, well, I'm making about $20 for an hour. Not true. Not true. If that was true, you could just stay home, have them send your money. No, it's not true. You don't get paid for the hour. You get paid for the value you put in the time. So we don't get paid for time. We get paid for value. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of the afternoon. Is it possible to become twice as valuable and make twice as much money in the same time? Is it possible to become three times as valuable as you now are and make three times as much money in the same time? Is that possible? Of course. If you want to really emphasize something, that's a good phrase to it. Of course. Of course. Okay. Now, all you have to do to earn more money in the same time is simply become more valuable. And then you just keep becoming more valuable, more valuable, more valuable. I got a telephone call five years ago. The company said, we're ready to expand internationally. We need some help. I was sort of semi-retired, right? Looking for the next exotic beach. They said, no, no, Mr. Rohn, we got a project for you, right? We're going to expand internationally. We could use your help. Next little while, we'll add a some millions to your fortune, make it worth your while. I said, okay. <laughs> I thought later, isn't that interesting that they called me? My second thought was, of course they'd call me. Who else would they call? I mean, you know, <laughs> I can get the job done. Now, how come, how come I got a telephone call worth millions? I had become valuable. Now, I'm a farm boy from Idaho. I was raised in obscurity. One year of college, and I thought I was thoroughly educated. Made all kinds of mistakes galore. At age 25, the creditors are calling me saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I got pennies in my pocket. I got nothing in the bank. I'm behind on my promises. How come I get a telephone call five years ago and it's worth millions? I changed. I changed. I turned my life around. Is it possible to become worth millions? Speaking economically, now there's a lot of values to become, but let's just talk economics. Is it possible to become that valuable? And the answer is, of course, of course. Now let me give you the secret. Show said, here's the secret, Mr. Rohn. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I got that, it turned my life around. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. He said, if you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. Wow. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy, I don't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late, I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. 
You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on my self. I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think it over. <laughs> and start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity. If you'll start working harder on yourself than you do, on your job. Work hard on yourself and develop the skills. Work hard on yourself and develop the graces. All of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, your whole life can explode into change. Number one, sincerity. Above all else today, I hope you'll find me sincere. Important note to make, sincerity is not a test of truth. We must not make the mistake of saying he must be right, he's so sincere. That would be a mistake. And here's why. It's possible to be sincerely wrong. So we don't mistake sincerity for truth, right? Sincerity is only a test of sincerity. Truth has to yet be tested by truth. The guy says, this happens to me, this happens to me, this goes wrong for me, and all this stuff goes wrong for me. How come all this stuff happens to me? I say, I don't know, it beats me. The best I've been able to figure out is those kind of things always happen to people like you. I mean, right? <laughs> That's the best I got. I don't know. I'm an amateur on this stuff. What do I know? So just take the simple approach, right? That's how it is. Who knows? Interesting story says the day the Christian church was started. Now I'm an amateur on the Bible, but best account I can remember, the day the Christian church was started, a magnificent sermon was preached great presentation and if you're a student of all at all of good communication it was one of the classic presentations of all times the sermon the first day the christian church was started and it said this sermon this presentation was given to a multitude meaning a lot of people but it was interesting as the account gives us the record it says when the sermon was finished there was a variety of reaction to the same sermon isn't that fascinating i find it fascinating it said some that heard this presentation were perplexed. And I read the presentation, sounded pretty straightforward to me. He said, why would somebody be perplexed with a good, sincere, straightforward presentation? Best answer I've got, they are the perplexed. I mean, you know, what other explanation is there? It doesn't matter who's preaching. It said some that heard this presentation mocked and laughed, made fun of the presentation. I thought, hey, this looks pretty sincere to me. If you give a sincere, honest presentation, why would somebody mock and laugh? Easy explanation. They are the mockers and the laughers. What else would you expect them to do? Right. I used to try to straighten all that out, say, well, they shouldn't do that. I don't do that anymore. You know, I've got peace of mind now. I sleep like a baby, not try to straighten all this stuff out. I used to be so naive. I used to say, well, liars shouldn't lie. See, how naive can you be? Of course, they're supposed to lie. That's why we call them liars. They lie, they lie. So I don't straighten this stuff out anymore. Anyway, it said some that heard this magnificent presentation didn't know what was going on. And they're usually easy to spot. They're usually saying, what's going on, right? I mean, they don't know what's going on. But interesting, right? A variety of reaction to the same sincere, honest presentation. Now, it also says, in wrapping it up, some that heard the presentation believed. And I think that's who the speaker was looking for, the believers. Interesting. Now, it said the number of believers was about 3,000. So, pretty good first day. 3,000. I've had some first days, but I never had 3,000. But anyway, 3,000 were believers. And that's, the speaker was looking for the believers out of this multitude. And that's about as close as we can come to understanding the mystery some believe and some mock and some laugh and some are perplexed and some don't know what's going on and you just have to leave it that way why because that's the way it's going to be the way to be brilliant is to find out how it's going to be and then say here's how it should be i mean that's how you become brilliant so anyway who knows the mystery i call it mysteries of the mind we don't understand but i don't try to change it anymore on this particular story as far as we know 
They didn't have classes after the presentation to try to de-perplex the perplexed. I mean, as far as we know, they left them perplexed. They left the mockers mocking. They let the laughers laugh. I mean, they didn't come back and try to straighten all this out. You say, well, how can you build a church? Well, make another presentation and you'll get some believers and some mockers and some laughers and some who don't know what's going on. So that's about the best we can do. Don't be a follower, be a student, right? Take advice, but not orders. Take information, but don't let somebody, you know, order your life. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Excellent note to make. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Not to do what someone else says. Take what someone else says. Process it. Think about it. Ponder it. If it makes you wonder, if it makes you think, then it's valuable. Then, when you go take action, make sure that the action is not what somebody told you to do. Make sure the action is the product of your own conclusion. Fundamentals. Fundamentals. We, we call, call these, these basics. Basics, basics, basics for, sports. for sports. Fundamentals for sports. Fundamentals for, sports. Fundamentals for, for your, your business. business. Fundamentals, Fundamentals for the way you deal with your family. A few simple things. A few, few basic, basic things that if you practice, practice every day can make all the difference in the world, how it works out. out. I boil it down to five major pieces of the life puzzle. Let's, Let's just review those. those. Number one is philosophy. Philosophy, as I talked the last time I was here, philosophy, in my personal opinion, is the major determining factor in how your life works out. Philosophy, the major determining factor in how your life works out. Philosophy, to form our philosophy, you've got to think. Got to use your mind. Got to process ideas. And this whole process over a lifetime, starting way back here when we were children, schools that we've attended, our parents, our experiences, all this stuff that we've processed by the thinking process, helps to develop our philosophy. And in my opinion, each person's personal philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. Here's what I called it in that last presentation when I was here. It's, it's called the set of the sail. sail. Each person's personal, personal philosophy is like the set of the sail. sail. Here's what's exciting about each person's personal philosophy. That's what makes us different than dogs and animals and birds and cats and spiders and alligators. That's what makes us different than all other life forms. The ability to think, the ability to use your mind, the ability to process ideas and not just operate by instinct. In the winter, I'm telling you, the goose can only fly south. What if south doesn't look too good? Tough luck. It can only fly south. But see, human beings are not like a goose, can only fly south. I mean, you can turn around, go north, you can go east, you can go west, you can order the entire process of your own life. And we do that by the way we think, we do that by exercising our mind, we do that by processing ideas and come up with a better philosophy, a better strategy for our life, goals for the future, okay? Plans to achieve those goals. All this comes from developing our philosophy. Philosophy helps us to process what's available. Well, when we get here, we got seed and we got soil and we got some rain and we've got some what? Sunshine and we've got some seasons and what? The miracle of life. Now, the key is, what do you do with all this stuff? How do you turn all this stuff that's available here into equity and promise and lifestyle and dreams and future possibilities? All of this that's possible now with human beings, how do you take all this stuff and turn it into this equities and values? Well, it starts with philosophy. What is the seed? What is the soil? What is the sunshine? What is the rain? Is it possible to take some of each of all the stuff that's available and turn it into food and turn it into value and turn it into nourishment, and turn it into something spectacular and unique that no other life form can do? And the answer is yes. But you cannot deal with all this stuff and what to do with it unless you start refining your philosophy. Think, use your mind, come up with ideas and strengthen your philosophy. So the seed and the soil and the rain and the sunshine, this is called, you know, the economy and the banks and the money and the schools and uh, everything that's available out there, processing, 
information, what to do with all that, and turn it into equity and value. That is the major challenge of life, my personal opinion. So each person's personal philosophy now is going to determine what you're going to do with seed and soil and sunshine and rain, and miracle, the change of seasons. That's it. You don't need a better economy. You don't need better seed and soil. In fact, when it comes to seed and soil and rain and sunshine and seasons and the miracle of life, that's all you got. Now, what if you blame this stuff? Then you're blaming all you got. If you blame the economy and you blame the schools and you blame the teachers and you blame the sermons and the preachers and, and you blame, uh, you know, the marketplace and you blame the company and company policy, what else is there? When some people get through with their blame list, there isn't nothing else. That's all there is. And if you blame the only thing you've got to work with, I'm telling you, it's called mistake colossal. In not understanding that that's all you've got to work with. Then what do you change to make your life work well? You've got to start with your philosophy. Guess what I had to do at age 25 in order to change my own future. I had to change my mind. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. And the early results I got from making these philosophical changes tasted so good. I've never stopped the process from that day until this. Here's the definition of success and failure. Just make this note. Here's failure. A few errors in judgment. Repeated every Day. Now, you can automatically assume, Mr. Owen, I say, I can understand that. A few errors in judgment repeated every day. For six years? I'm with my father. I think I told this story the last time I was here. My father, 88 years old, he's never been ill, still hasn't retired. Not long ago, midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. We've drilled a new well, got some extra water. Got some more acres going. He's all excited. At midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. My father's eating what he calls his midnight snack. A little bite to eat before you go to bed. Don't have to go to bed hungry. And I'm watching him eat this midnight snack. Guess what he had? An apple, a few graham crackers, and a glass of grapefruit juice. I said, no wonder my father's so healthy. My mom taught us all those good health practices. Taught me when I'm growing up, right? I'm an only child. I've never been ill. Passed the big 5-0 some time ago. My two daughters, 32, 33, never been ill. My grandkids, never been ill. I'm telling you, the legacy lingers on. As I watched my father have this midnight snack, suddenly it occurred to me. I know that's part of it. An apple, what? A day. That's gotten to Dallas-Fort Worth, right? An apple. <laughs> An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Good question for this intelligent audience. What if that's true? You say, well, Mr. Owen, if that's true, that would be easy to do, then what's the problem? It's easy not to do. It's easy not to adopt it as your own personal philosophy. Or the guy messed up to say. Guy says, a Hershey bar a day. Say, no, no. You've been watching too much television. It is not Hershey bar. You gotta be smarter in philosophy than to fall for the Hershey bar a day when it's an apple a day. You've got to be smarter than that. And if you make that kind of an error in judgment every day for six years, I'm telling you, it'll accumulate into disaster. Now, once I understood this, here's the formula for failure, errors in judgment, being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. I'm telling you, it's called accumulated disaster. It doesn't matter whether it's your health or your bank account. Guy's got an empty bank account, probably has high cholesterol. Why? Over the last six years, he never paid attention to either one. And it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar or whether it's your money or whether it's your cholesterol count. All you got to do is commit the errors and just because disaster doesn't fall on you at the end of the first day that you don't eat an apple. You say, well, I didn't eat an apple today and tonight I'm not ill. Well, you got to be brighter than that. Someday you've got to leave first grade. The reason we make those first grade desks so small so they won't fit at age 25. I mean, right? <laughs> you don't belong here anymore. Come on. Now let me give you the secret to success. 
The formula for failure, a few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month, starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happens in six years. Now here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And you've started a whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And if you decide today to go for the apple instead of the Hershey bar, I'm telling you, you have begun the process of turning your life around. And if you keep up that process, not only with your health habits, but with your money habits and with your communication habits, with your sales habits and management habits and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors and replace it with disciplines practiced, I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately. After today, you don't ever have to be the same again. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday. Somebody says, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. <laughs> Guess what I want people to say? I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you the man works on his craft. I'm telling you the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you he's worked hard on himself. That's why he's able to deliver like he does. The same thing can happen for you. Don't challenge this. You don't have to ask for another planet. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. And you can start this whole process of personal life change. Now I could spend the whole day on philosophy because that's where it is. If I could get you intrigued with that enough to study it, enough to ponder it, to where you'd pick up the commitment like I did and say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block, why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you gonna start? Number two is attitude. We're affected by how we feel. First, we're affected by what we know and the decisions we, and the decisions we make. Second, we're affected by attitude, how we feel. And I gave that quick list, let me give it to you. It's how you feel about the past, you gotta have a good attitude about the past. Use it as a school, not a club. Don't beat yourself to death with your past. Faults, failures, losses. Let the past be a school. Harsh school, maybe. What else is new? Let the past be a school master to teach you. Not to threaten you, but to teach you. Okay. Next, it's how you feel about the future. Set your goals. And here's the last one. It's how you feel about yourself. Understanding self-worth is the beginning of progress. So we don't start with inspiration, we start with education. Somebody says, well, just motivate this guy, he'll be all right. Just motivate him, get him turned on. Probably not. If a guy's an idiot, you motivate him, now you got a motivated idiot. <laughs> no, he won't be all right. So number two was attitude. Here was number three, activity. This is the work part, the labor part. Taking action. And the activity is the miracle working piece. A miracle being something we don't quite understand how it works. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means we just don't quite understand how it works. Miracles work. God says, now I'm an amateur on God, but here's my best analysis. God says, if you'll plant the seed, I'll make the tree. Now that's a good arrangement. Number one, gives God the tough end of the deal. What if you had to make the tree? That'd keep you up late night trying to figure out. How do you make a tree? I say, no, I'm telling you, the mystery and the miracle of this stuff has already been set up. God says, I got the miracle going, I got the seasons going, I got some sunshine and some rain, and I'm God. But the way I've arranged it, I just need somebody to plant the seed, not chant. In California, they're trying to chant to get this stuff done. Forget this California stuff. You don't have to rub a crystal and sleep under a pyramid. This stuff's too easy. Getting rich is too easy. Changing your life is too easy. Forget all that. Right? Massive bombard, affirmation, forget all that. My opinion. Ocean waves and seagulls? Come on, this stuff's too simple. Just simple, easy stuff. But if you neglect it, that's how it piles up year after year. But if you're willing to straighten it out. And here's one of the keys. It's called activity. It's called disciplines. Turning wisdom from your philosophy and inspiration 
the strengthening of attitude and faith and courage, commitment and all this stuff that comes from attitude. If you're willing to take these two qualities, philosophy and attitude, and invest it into activity, you can have a miracle. Results. Here's all life asks us to do, make measurable progress in reasonable time. Just take home that little phrase, good phrase. We're asked in life simply to make measurable progress in reasonable time. We demand it of our children. How many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? <laughs> Approximately. <laughs> About one. If it looks like they're not going to make it, we pour on the pressure. Call legitimate pressure, lack of results. Peer pressure, family pressure, school pressure, community pressure. Every other kind of pressure we can bring to bear. Why? You can't stay more than one year in fourth grade. As parents, you'd have to leave the community. You say, well, what if they're nice kids? Wouldn't you give them three or four years? And the answer is no. You've got to make better progress than that. So you've got to check fairly often. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. Salesman joins this little sales company. He's supposed to make 10 calls first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate? Call him in on Friday and say, John, what? How many calls? I mean, this stuff is simple. John says, well, say, John, well won't fit in this little box here. Well. <laughs> Now John starts with a story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. <laughs> I don't need a story. I need what? A number. A number. What will a number tell me? Everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You say, wow, wow, we got somebody. What if he only made one call? Whoa. Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change, all he has to do is be willing to face the numbers and come up with the results that will teach you to either celebrate if you got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude, activity called discipline. How many pounds overweight should you be at age 50? <laughs> Approximately. John says, I got big bones. We'll give you 10 pounds. <laughs> 10 pounds for big bones. Otherwise, come on, John. 20 pounds, 25 pounds. Shouldn't we turn on the caution light at work and at home? Blinking caution lights, and this is what's that caution light? So John's up about 20, 25 pounds. We got the blinking light going at home, got it going here at work. To remind him what? Wrong numbers. Okay, 35, 40 pounds, red light, blinking at home. Somebody says, what's that blinking red light? Say, John's up about 40 pounds. <laughs> 50 pounds, we got the siren. <laughs> What's that siren at home and at work? John's up about 50 pounds. <laughs> Cholesterol, almost out of control. Come on. Success is a numbers game. I'm asking you to be mature enough to start checking your own numbers. How many books have you read in the last 90 days? Transform your life. Become cultured, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the rest of the stuff you want. How many books? How many classes? How committed are you? to taking what's available. After applying better philosophy, attitude, and, res and activity, and picking now up results, what are results for? Here's my ultimate challenge on results. To fashion, good word to jot down, fashion. Fashion for yourself lifestyle, or what we call the good life. That's the ultimate challenge, to take your results, take your money, Take your results, take the return, take the equities you've gathered, and now fashion for yourself a good life, like weaving a tapestry. And Mr. Shelf gave me all kinds of examples on lifestyle. 
He gave me two phrases that helped change my life. In case you have to leave early, let me give you these two phrases. It'll be worth the price of coming and being here today. Just take these two phrases home in case you have to leave early. Here's number one. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, if you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. When he said that, I said, my gosh, I don't know anybody that studies wealth. Where am I going to learn it? He said, never mind, Mr. Owen, now that you've met me, if you'll be with me for a while, he said, and if you'll commit yourself, he said, I will teach you. And he taught me. He taught me the books. He taught me the stuff. Changed my life. By the time I was 31, I was a millionaire. The man taught me well. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Here was the second phrase. Mr. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, if you wish to be happy, study happiness. I didn't know happiness was a study. My best hope for happiness at age 25 was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. <laughs> Open somehow, something would make me happy. Shelf said, no, Mr. Rohn, happiness is not something you postpone. Happiness is not something off in the future. Happiness is something you design. You've got to get the word. Happiness is something you design. Key phrase, don't be lazy in learning. One, how to do well. Next, how to live well. Don't be lazy in learning and practicing the art of economics, practicing the art of productivity, and practicing the art of lifestyle. Shove taught me in such simple terms. Shove said, Mr. Owen, if you're getting your shoes shined, shoe shine boy has done an exceptional job. You look down, you got one of the world's all time great shines. And you pay him. Now, you got a little change in your hand. Question pops in your mind. Should I give him one quarter or two quarters as a tip from a neat shine? Here's what Shelf said. If two amounts pop in your mind, always go for the higher amount and become the higher thinking person. That helped change my life. Here's what he said. Become a two quarter person. Now you can tell that was a long time ago when a quarter was a good tip. Now it takes dollars. But just substitute 1992 dollars for quarters. Show said, hey, if you, you know, are thinking one quarter or two quarters, and you say, well, no, I'll just give you one quarter. He said, that'll affect you the rest of the day. The rest of the day, you'll look down, see this great shine. You'll say, I got to be really cheap. One lousy quarter tip from a shine. But he said, if you'll go for the two quarters, Show said, you can't believe the extra happiness you can buy for just an extra quarter. That's called studying and practicing the art of lifestyle, which means living well. Here's the big challenge of life. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That's the challenge. And of course, the other side of the coin reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you got. I have found in my experience that income does not far exceed personal development. Now, sometimes income takes a lucky jump, but sure enough, unless you grow out where it is, it'll usually come back where you are. Life has strange ways. If somebody hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly. So you get to keep the money. Otherwise, sure enough, it'll disappear. Somebody once said, if you took all the money in the world, divided it up equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets. Incredible. Success is something you attract, not something you pursue. Success is looking for a good place to stay. So instead of going after it, you work on yourself, personal development. See, the major question to ask on the job is not what are you getting, the major question to ask on the job is, what are you becoming? See, the big question is, not what am I getting paid here? The big question is, what am I becoming here? Because true happiness is not contained in what you get. 
Happiness is contained in what you become. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met him, he said, Jim, let me see your current list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. He said, maybe that's the best way I can help you get a better direction started. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or home somewhere? I said, uh, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we got to start. He said, I can tell you right now, if you don't have a list of your goals with you, he said, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would change if I had a list of goals? He said, drastically. That day I became a willing student how to set goals. And sure enough, learning how to set goals changed my life. And I often wondered why no one had ever taught me how to set goals up until age 25. I went to high school, but if they offered it, I missed it. I went to college for a year, never heard it. I worked for Sears. <laughs> really? And to my knowledge, Sears never taught it. Right? How to set goals. So here I am, age 25, married, my family's starting, I've been to college, I'm working, and I still don't know how to set goals. But fortunately, when I was 25, I met the man who taught me how, and it revolutionized my whole life. Develop an above average smile. Develop an above average excitement. Develop an above average interest in other people. Develop an above average intensity to win. See, that'll change everything. Probably one of the most frustrating experiences in life is looking for an above average job with above average pay without becoming an above average person. I did a seminar one time for Standard Oil executives and management in Honolulu. And uh, we're having a conference one day on this big conference table. And one of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, you know some fairly important people halfway around the world. What do you think the 80s are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. I can tell you. So they all listened very carefully. And I said, gentlemen, based on my wide experience, I can really honestly say to you, in my opinion, in the 80s, it's going to be about like it's always been. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came? That's inside. I don't pass that around just everywhere. <laughs> now, of course, I said that to make a point, but I also said it because it's accurate. It's going to be about like it's always been. It isn't going to change. The tide comes in and then what? It goes out for six and a half thousand years that we know of, recorded history, and probably long before that. So it is not going to change. It gets light and then what? It turns dark. Six and a half thousand years. See, it's not likely to change. And we're not to be startled by that. If the sun goes down, the guy says, what's happened, what's happened? It means he hasn't been here long, I guess, right? <laughs> it always goes down about this time. <laughs> the guy says, well, I don't like that arrangement. Well, you've got to talk to somebody besides me, right? <laughs> it gets light, then it turns dark. In rotation, the next season after fall is what? Winter. Pray tell how often does winter follow fall? Every year regularly for the last six and a half thousand that we know of. See, it is not going to change. Now, some winters are long, and some are short, and some are hard, and some are easy, but they always come right after falls. It isn't going to change. Sometimes you can figure it out. Sometimes there's no way to figure it out. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it gets in a knot. Sometimes it sails along. Sometimes it gets in reverse. See, that's not going to change. The last 6,000 years reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. That's how it reads. It isn't going to change. The man says, well, if it isn't going to change, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. Now, let me give you two phrases before we get to the four majors. This will set it up and you'll see where I'm going. Two key phrases for your notes. Here's the first one. Life and business is like the changing seasons. That's the first phrase. Life and business is like the changing seasons. One of the best ways to describe life, it's like the seasons. 
Frank Sinatra sings, life is like the seasons. Now here's the second phrase, very important. You cannot change the seasons, but you can change yourself. Now here's the four major lessons in life to learn. I've got my first book finished, came out a couple of weeks ago. This is in it, the four major lessons in life to learn. Here they are. Number one, learn how to handle the winters. That's lesson one. They come right after falls with regularity. Some are long and some are short and some are hard and some are easy, but they keep coming. You must learn to handle the nights. They come right after days. You must learn to handle difficulty. It comes right after opportunity. You must learn to handle recessions. They always follow progressions for the last 6,000. See, it isn't going to change. The lesson you must learn is how to handle it. And there's all kinds of winters, right? The winter when you can't figure it out. The winter when it all goes smash. The winter when it turns belly up. The winter when it won't work, when you've run out of money and you've got a broken heart. See, those are winter times. There's all kinds. Economic winters, social winters, personal winters. When your heart is smashed in a thousand pieces and the nights are unusually long, your prayers seem to go no higher than your head. It's winter time. Barbara Streisand sings, it used to be so natural to talk about forever, but used to be's don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor till we sweep them away. You don't sing me love songs, and you don't say you need me, and you don't bring me flowers anymore. A song of winter. But see, the disappointments come. Those are normal. That's part of life. But the question is, how do you handle it? How do you handle the coming winters and the disappointments and the downtimes? Well, you can't get rid of January by tearing it off the calendar. <laughs> but here's what you can do. You can get stronger, you can get wiser, and you can get better. The winters won't change, but you can. And that's how life changes for you. Here's lesson two. Learn how to take advantage of the spring. That's the second one. Spring is called opportunity. And spring follows winter. What a great place for it. If you were going to put it somewhere, that'd be the place to put it, right after winter. And pray tell, how often does spring follow winter? Every year with regularity, 6,000. You can almost count on it. <coughs> See, opportunity always comes. Days follow nights. Isn't that terrific? Opportunity follows difficulty. But here's what you must learn to do. Underline these two words in that key phrase. Take advantage. Underline those two. You must learn to take advantage of the spring. See, just because spring rolls around is no sign you're going to look good come fall. You got to do something with it. In fact, you have to get good at one of two things in life. Planting in the spring or begging in the fall. Or get somebody to do it for you. See, those are about the only alternatives. Now here's what else you must do. Take advantage of the springs quickly because there's only a few. Just a handful of springs have been handed to each of us. They don't come forever. Life is fairly brief. So you got to read every book you can get your hands on on what to do with your springs while they're here. And take advantage, they soon run out. The Beatles wrote, life is so short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. But life is brief. Elton John sings, she lived her life like a candle in the wind. It's brief. So whatever you're going to do with your life, you've got to get at it. Don't just let the springs pass, pass, pass. Here's the third major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to protect your crops all summer. <laughs> you got to take care of what you start. Sure enough, as soon as you've planted your garden in the spring, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. 
And here's the next bit of truth. They will take it <laughs> unless you prevent it. And that's the third major skill to learn. You've got to learn to prevent the intruder from taking all the good you start. It's one of the challenges. Here's two key phrases under number three. First one, all good will be attacked on this planet. Maybe not the next one we get to, but on this one, all good will be attacked. Every garden will be invaded. Not to think so is naive. And here's the second phrase. All values must be defended. Political values, social values, community values, family values, marriage values, friendship values, business values. Every garden must be tended all summer. Third major lesson. Now here's number four. Fourth major lesson in life to learn. Learn how to reap in the fall without complaint. Learn to reap come harvest time without complaint. Take full responsibility for what happens to you. It's one of the highest forms of human maturity, accepting full responsibility. It's the day you know you've passed from childhood to adulthood, the day you accept full responsibility. And another note. Learn to reap in the fall without apology. Without apology if you do well and without complaint if you don't. That's maturity. I used to have that long list of reasons why I wasn't doing well. To explain. You've got to explain, right? Otherwise you're going to look bad. I used to have this funny list called reasons for not looking good. One day with sort of a curious look on his face, he said, Jim, just out of curiosity, tell me, how come you haven't done well up until now? Excellent question. <laughs> I thought, well, so I won't look too bad, I'll go through my list. <laughs> and this list I just gave you, I put that on him. And he was very patient. He let me go through the whole thing, the government, the weather, I went through this whole thing. When I finished, he looked my list over very carefully. He said, Mr. Rohn, big problem with your list. You ain't on it. <laughs> How brilliant. <laughs> when I went to work for him a few months later, I learned very quickly to tear up my list, reasons for not doing well, and I threw it away. And I got me a fresh piece of paper. And I put one word on it. Me. Two men wake up one morning, there's a rainstorm on. One of them looks out his window, sees the rainstorm, and he says, Wow, what a storm! With weather like this, they can't expect you to go out and make sales. He stays home. <laughs> same morning, the other guy looks out his window, sees the same storm, says, Wow, what a storm! But he says, You know what, with weather like this, what a great day to go out and make sales. Most everybody will probably be home. Especially the salesman. <laughs> See, that's the difference in how your life works out. It's not what happens, it's what you do. So here's one of the key questions of the evening. Starting tomorrow, what are you going to do that'll make a change in your life's direction? Good question. What are you going to do starting tomorrow that'll make a difference? Now see, if you don't do something starting tomorrow that'll make a difference, guess what? It's going to be the same. <laughs> and see, that way you can guess what the next five years are going to be like. Look at the last five. If you don't like your present address, change it. You're not a tree. <laughs> now, let me give you three steps to personal development. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. What does it take to really make the changes starting tomorrow? It takes more than philosophical pronouncement. I know that. It also takes more than enthusiasm. I know we're hearing a lot about enthusiasm these days, but see, that just won't do the job. We're still here on the old cliches of the 30s, right? To be enthusiastic, you must act enthusiastic. 
<laughs> but see, that's not going to help. After you have leaped about, there are some things you got to do, <laughs> or it isn't going to change. See, you can get all excited about lifting 200 pounds till you get to the gym. And then you need a new excitement. And the new excitement is called discipline. Major step to human progress, discipline. If there's one thing to get excited over, that's it. Get excited over your ability to make yourself do the necessary things. What could you make yourself do starting tomorrow that would change it all? No telling. Now, see, that's exciting. On any given day, you can massively change the direction of your life. Murder is a clear example that any one person on any given day can forever alter the course of their life. It just happens to be a negative act. But just as sure as you can commit a negative act, you can also commit a positive act and forever alter your life whenever you wish. Now that's exciting. And whatever that act might be that changes your life. The guy finally takes a shotgun to his car and blows out every window, destroys every tire, puts a hundred rounds in this shabby old thing. And he says, I have driven this embarrassing thing for the last time. And not only will I never drive it again, nobody else will ever drive it again. And he lets that shuddering thing stand there for a while as a monument to the day he said, today my life changes. Now who can do that? Anybody. When can you do it? Whatever day you pick. <laughs> now here's the key to discipline. Start with the little disciplines, get excited over the little disciplines, and get right on those because those will lead to the big ones. You can't handle the big challenges in life unless you take on the little ones. Make a list of all the things you can do. Get right on those. Discipline yourself for those, both for the results and for the muscle and for the practice. So that when life hands you some big challenges, you'll be ready, you'll have the muscle. But see, if you don't handle the small ones, you can't take care of the big ones. People have to change themselves. I learned some of those lessons early. I built a little sales organization way back in those early days. I'm 25 and I had some nice people. I said, I'm going to make these people successful if it kills me. I almost died. Right? I mean, you can't do that. So you got to find the right people. That's the key to getting a good job done. One of the major things we learn in man management, lesson one, don't send your ducks to Eagle School. <laughs> Because it won't help. I mean, I'm telling you, it won't help, no matter how good your school is. And the little eagle badge and little eagle hat. I'm telling you, it won't help. It won't help. <laughs> you got to be like children. Four ways, in my opinion, to be like a child. Number one's curiosity. Number two is excitement. Get excited like a child over your ability to make yourself do anything for change. Third is faith. Have faith like a child. Adults are too skeptical. And fourth is trust. Trust is a childish virtue, but the rewards are incredible. So be like a child. Now, if you're curious, let me give you three ways to find out how to change anything, any life direction, any dimension. Here's three ways to find out how to change anything. Number one is to read. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They got to know. They just read, 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 read. Become a good reader. See, one book might save you five years if you read it. Did you know there's books on how to be stronger, more decisive? Be a speaker, be a leader, have a better effect on other people, develop your personality. Did you know there's books on that? And people don't read them? 
How would you explain that? And they can read. Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good reader. See, there's nothing worse than being stupid. Nothing. I mean, being broke is bad, but being stupid is awful. And what's really bad is being broke and stupid, right? <laughs> That's about the end of the world. I mean, there isn't anything much worse than that. Unless you're sick. Sick, broken, stupid. I mean, that is it, right? There's nowhere else to go. So make sure you get the information. It's key. You don't have to like it, but learn it. Okay, the next subject is setting goals. Let me show you what turned my life every way but loose. Mr. Schof dropped this idea on me, changed me completely. Setting goals. Here's what can easily happen if you don't set goals. It's easy to let life deteriorate into making a living instead of designing a life. And we all have a choice, make a living or design a life. It's easy to get trapped by economic necessity and settle for existence rather than substance. That's easy. But the best advice I, I can give you on how to break out of that trap is to learn how to set goals. Mr. Shelf put it to me this way. He said, Jim, if you had enough reasons, you could do the most incredible things. I never forgot how he put that. If you have enough reasons. See, reasons will change your whole life. Mr. Shelf said to me, he said, Mr. Rohn, I think you've got plenty of intelligence, you've got plenty of talent, you've got plenty of ability. Probably what you lack is plenty of reasons. He said, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indication of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you're much smarter than your present bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. But of course, my first question was, well, then why isn't it bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons. You've got enough intelligence, but not enough reasons. So see, reasons can change your life. Here's what else I found out. Reasons come first, answers come second. You don't get the answers to do well till you get the reasons. Life has a mysterious way of hanging on to all the answers and only gives them up to the people that are inspired by reasons. So reasons make the difference in how your life works out. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? Let's go through a quick list called reasons for doing well. First is personal reasons. Some people do well for recognition. Some people do well for respect. Some people do well for the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. Those are good reasons. I have some millionaire friends that keep working 10, 12 hours a day, making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because they need the joy and the satisfaction and the pleasure that comes from being a constant winner. 
And see, it's not just the money anyway. It's the journey, not the money. Once in a while, somebody says to me, boy, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. That's probably why the good Lord sees to it they don't get their million, right? <laughs> They'd quit. They'd quit. Okay. Next is family reasons. Some people do extremely well for other people, and that's powerful. Human beings can greatly affect each other. Sometimes we will do things for somebody else we will not do for ourselves. We are made that way. I met a man one time who said, Mr. Owen, to do all the things I want to do with my family around the world, he said, I got to have at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a guy's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people that find themselves greatly affected by somebody for personal achievement. And we are affected. The writer of a recent song said, if not for you, the winter would hold no spring, couldn't hear a robin sing. I just wouldn't have a clue if not for you. So we can be affected. That might be one of the most stimulating reasons to do well, finding somebody. When Andrew Carnegie died, the wee little Scotsman that built the big steel industry, when he died, they opened up his desk. And in one of the desk drawers, they found a slip of paper. On that piece of paper, Mr. Carnegie had written his goal for his life. And he wrote it when he was in his 20s. And on that piece of paper, it said, I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. What a goal. He got so inspired by that goal that the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And the last half of his life, he gave it all away. Good question tonight. What's got you turned on? What's got you bombed out of sight to get up early and stay up late and hit it all day? Next question. What's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what had me turned off and I got that cured. And then I got me a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me, age 25, they've never gone out. I've fallen out of the sky a few times, but I've never lost that drive to make something unique out of my life. See, reasons altered my whole life. Now, there's another list of reasons called nitty gritty. Hard little reasons. Sometimes those little reasons are the most powerful reasons that can change your life. Sometimes it doesn't take much. I now carry several hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars, but it was one of those reasons turned my life around. Just before I met Mr. Shove, I heard a knock at the door. I go to the door. And there's a little girl standing there about this tall selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. Special deal, several flavors, this whole package of stuff, $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. I'm broke. I don't have two dollars and to this day I can remember the pain and the embarrassment I'm a father I'm a husband I've been to college I'm working I'm 25 I don't have two dollars and I didn't want to tell her that for some reason 
So I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. I said, hey, look, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. I've still got plenty stacked in the house, which was not true. But it seemed to get me off the hook for the moment. She said, well, gosh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And she went away. When she left, I closed the door. And that was the day I said to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I've had it with lying and I've had it with being broke. I'm never going to let this happen to me ever again. I promised that day I would work as hard as possible and would always carry plenty. It took me a little while, but now I do. It was one of those reasons. And I guess I carry plenty for two reasons. One is the way it makes me feel, but also in case I bump into another Girl Scout selling cookies, <laughs> right? I'm ready. I walked out of the Bank of America one time up in Saratoga, California, where I used to live. Two little girls selling candy right outside the bank. Good place. <laughs> Some girls organization they're working for, right? I come walking out of the bank. This first little girl walks up to me. She said, Mister, would you like to buy some candy? I said, I probably would. What kind is it? She said, it's Almond Roca. I said, my gosh, that's my favorite. She said, wonderful. I said, how much is it? She said, it's just $2. I thought, incredible. I said, how many boxes of that candy have you got? She said, five. And her little friend was standing there. She was selling candy too. I said, how many boxes have you got? She said, I've got four. I said, that's nine. I'll take them all. They said, really? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's my favorite. I've got some friends. I'll pass them around. They got so excited, put all this candy together. I reached in my pocket, gave them the $18. When I've got the candy and they've got the money, that first little girl looked up, looks up at me. She says, Mister, you are really something. How about that? Can you imagine only spending $18 and have somebody look at you in the face and say, you are really something? Now you know why I carry heavy, right? <laughs> I'm not going to miss any more. It was just one of those reasons helped to change my life. Let me get you started with a little simple formula Mr. Schof gave me, and maybe this will be helpful. First of all, I've divided goals into two parts. First is long range. Long range goals. That's your dreams. Your dreams for the next three, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, actually the rest of your life. Your dreams. Here's the second part of goals, short range. Short range goals, that's your goals for tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, the immediate future. We call these confidence builders. Because if you set up something short range, go for it, get it, latch, latch onto it, work hard, accomplish it. That starts building your strong feelings to go for your dreams. Now, I've divided goals into three categories. Here they are. Number one is economic. That's your goals for money, income, business, profits, production. Economics. Make sure you've got your economics well planned. Economics plays a major role in everybody's life. Economics is major, which means it ought to be meticulously well-planned for tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, long range. What if you ask somebody tomorrow if you could see their meticulously well-planned list of economic goals? What would they probably say? They'd say, you some kind of a nut? You must be weird. Hey, I found out what success is. Success is doing what the failures won't do. 
make sure you've got your economics well planned. It'll put you in the top 5%. Now here's the second category of goals, things. Make a list of the things you want. And on my list of things, now I put everything. Little things as well as major things. Doesn't matter how small it is, it goes on my list. I used to just put major things, cars, homes. I don't do that anymore. I now load my list with everything, everything. And the reason is part of the fun of having a list is checking it off. That's it. Boy, at the end of the day, if you can go, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, whatever it is, right? You get into the habit. So load up your list, the things you want. Now, when you check off something major, celebrate. That's an important point to make. Celebrate your achievements. Live it up, have a party. When you reach something you've worked for for a while. See, we all grow from two experiences. One is called the pain of losing. The other one is called the joy of winning. We need both of them. Amplify them as much as you can, which also means make losing painful. If you set up something, fooled around, didn't get it, put it on yourself. On the other side, if you did get it, congratulate yourself. Self-congratulations is a sign of maturity. Seeking congratulations is a sign of immaturity. Okay, here's the third category of goals, personal development. Put those goals together, personal development goals. That's your goals to be stronger, more decisive, be a speaker, be a leader, learn a language, all kinds of skills. Okay, the whole weekend seminar was designed to improve all your skills so that you walk away more skillful. And that's what you want, the personal development skills. That's what attracts, that's what brings good things to your life, the person you become more skillful. Study your accomplishments, study what your desires are, put them on paper, write them down. Here's another reason for writing your goals down. It shows you're serious about doing better. And to do better, you gotta get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you must be serious. Your goals are affecting you, whatever they are. Your goals affect your handshake. Your goals affect your attitude, personality. Your goals affect the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress. All day long, we're being affected by our goals. Over caution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I'd be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life when I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. <laughs> that's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right. That's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day. And we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, care for you. We won't let anything happen to you. And you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah, I'd live to be 100. But what a way to live. Right. What a way to live safe and secure. Don't ask for security. Ask for adventure. 
Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Pessimism. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. And when he finds them, he's delighted. How ugly. This is the poor guy looks through the window, doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks on the window. <laughs> and this is the poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave of his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know. All he needs one. He's got five. <laughs> To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Why would the same measure affect people two different ways? Answer, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called better thinking habits. One of the major things Shove taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shove taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How awesome. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. They call you economic peewee. The guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory, and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. <laughs> You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. <laughs> Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. You might as well try making a cake with cement. The kids back in Danbury, Connecticut, high school, they're asking me questions one day. I'm talking to the kids. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about because that starts everything. You got to be wise and careful. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? 
They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if somebody dropped strychnine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson one, life is both sugar and strychnine. You gotta be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strychnine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson two, watch your coffee. <laughs> you gotta be careful. See, it doesn't matter who hands you the bad stuff. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It'll still do its damage on your bank account. Wherever you get it. Mr. Schoff gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. How important. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory, because you've got to live with the results. The last disease, but this one is deadly. Engage in this one, indulge in it even slightly, and you might as well forget the future, because it's gonna forget you. Complaining, crying, whining, griping, a Bible word called murmuring. See, that'll ace your future. Spend five minutes complaining and you have wasted five. And you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. Surely they will soon haul you off into a financial desert and there let you choke on the dust of your own regret. I hope I said that well, so you won't forget. It's a deadly disease. If you don't think it's bad, ask the children of Israel of Old Testament fame, Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. Story says, children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out. And now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land. Tragedy of the story, they never got there. Reason, from day one, they started to complain. They griped about the water. They griped about the weather. They whined and cried and griped about the food. They griped about the leadership. They whined and cried because it was too far, too cold, too hot, too difficult, too miserable. I mean, they whined and, whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it, trip canceled. <laughs> or something like that. The story says they died in the desert, never got to the promised land. Which I think means two things. Indulge in this long enough, you get your future canceled. And I guess it also means even God himself can only take so much. <laughs> Resolve. Resolve says I will, two of the most powerful words in the language. Benjamin Disraeli said, nothing can resist a human will that will stake its existence on its purpose. Shortly put, I'll do it or die. Best definition of resolve I got from a little junior high girl, Foster City, California. I'm going through some words one day. I got to this one and I asked the kids, who can tell me what resolve means? Some didn't know, some tried. Interesting. The last one was the best. Little girl about three years back, she said, I think I know Mr. Owen. I said, what? She said, I think resolve means promising yourself you will never give up. I said, that's the best I've ever heard. She's probably giving seminars somewhere today, right? I mean, that's the best I've heard. I asked the kids, how long should a baby try to learn how to walk? How long would you give your average baby? Before you say, hey, enough's enough. No. Any mother in the world would say, you're crazy. My baby is going to keep trying what? Until. What a magic word. I want you to write it down. Until. Promise yourself you'll read the books until your skills change. 
You'll go to seminars until you get a handle on it. You'll listen to it until it makes sense. You'll go for it until you understand it. You'll practice it until you develop the skill. Never give up until, however long that is, step by step, piece by piece, book by book, word by word, apple by apple, walk around the block, walk around the block, go for it. Don't miss the chance to grow and resolve that you'll pay the price until you learn, change, grow, become. Then you'll discover some of life's best treasures when you pay that price. Now here's my last word to you. As leaders in the community, I'm sure you are. Parents, the greatest challenge of leadership is parenting. Whether you're in sales or management, wherever I found you today, I want to give you from my heart to you what I wished you would do from this seminar today. And if I've inspired you to do this part here, among all the other things I've talked about, I would have considered it worthwhile to leave my family, fly away from my home, drop down into Fort Worth, Dallas, and spend one of my very precious days with you. If I can accomplish this, it'll all be worthwhile. It comes in two parts, and here it is. One, learn to help people with their lives, not just their jobs. Learn to help people with their lives, not just their skills on the job. Touch people with a book, touch people with a poem, touch people with some words. Don't fail to say something that could be meaningful. Help people with their lives, help them set their goals. Help them with their dreams, help them with the future, help them with errors, help them with mistakes. Help people, help your kids, not just get along, not just hang in there, not just try to hold the family together. Try to build lives with communication, build lives with setting goals. Help your kids with their lives, not just their homework, their lives. And here's my last one for you personally, because I'm probably the, one of the best examples of this standing before you in this auditorium today. Here it is, ancient script says, if you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. Wow. Look where my gifts have brought me today to this room. A chance to invest in this many lives.